Happy Friday once again, Nudge fans. Welcome to another episode of Nudge Coach Happy Hour. My name is Phil Bean. I'm here with the one and only Mac underscore Gamble. <laughs> Mac, how's it going? Still underscore. Still, still <laughs> underscore over here. Underscore. I feel like there should be deeper meaning to that underscore. But I know. I, we'll I we'll come like up I'm... with something clever at some point, I'm sure. I'll spend the weekend just thinking about it. For the record, if you're tracking your life by our podcast, this is Friday, May 21st. Are you ready for June? It's coming. It's coming fast. I think we have four listeners now. So maybe four listeners are tracking their life through this. I know. I know. Extreme growth, guys. <laughs> the next podcast episode is how to grow your podcast audience by 25%. There we go. There we go. But another interesting week in the world of online coaching, I'd say. Um, a lot happening. I think a lot happening in the world. Um, I think you had an interesting idea for the topic today, too. When, break it down. Well, here's what we were kicking around. So there's this theme that we kind of like underlying all of this that we keep kind of nudging up against, um, which is just sort of that the coaching world is growing in weird and rapid ways. Um, and, you know, I just thought we should dig into that a little bit and, and maybe try to explain what is going on that's driving this, why this is happening. And I think to start the conversation, we have to probably zoom out quite a bit if we're really going to kind of dig into this, because there's, there's probably some, some like really big, deep kind of mm-hmm the entire trends of the way society is moving things mm-hmm. going on kind of behind the scenes that are, are making this all happen. So to level set, you know, we, we see this like up close and in person every day because we're constantly having conversations with people who are moving coaching businesses online, launching new co- coaching businesses, all that stuff. And every day we see that like, okay, well, you know, Two years ago, it was very predictable that like, okay, the next person we talk to is probably going to be a health and wellness coach, a nutrition coach, you know, something along those lines that you would traditionally think of. And slowly, this is turning more and more into every day. We never know what we're going to come across in terms Mm -hmm. of the type of coaching that someone is doing. They're, uh, you know, a uh, student coach, a YouTube personality coach, uh, gaming coach, a baby sleep coach, you know, all kinds of, you know, different areas of expertise that are shifting into something that they call coaching and developing programs and delivering them, but in this kind of relationship focused um, interaction. So it's been this kind of underlying trend that I feel like we've been latching onto, but we haven't talked about why we think this is happening much. So I just wanted to dig into it a little bit. Um, And probably the place to start is just that, you know, if anyone has, and, and if you haven't, just Google the term creator economy or passion economy, even if you want to. These are kind of, um, there's different terms for this. Um, but the idea of the creator economy is basically that um, all these people are trying to monetize their passion. Um, they're building audiences online. Um, the easy way to think about it is a lot of influencers would fall into this. Um, but talking about, you know, their expertise and building an audience around it. And we're reaching this phase where all these people have these audiences and are seen as experts and trusted by the people that follow them. And they're at a phase where they're ready to kind of form a business around it and monetize those audiences. Um, and because obviously people are interested in all manner of different things and specialization, specialization is a beautiful thing. Um, all these niches are forming where people are pursuing their passion and gaining a following and then turning it into a business. And they're finding that coaching is a good fit for that. Um, so there's kind of an underlying force, I think, that's as far as I can possibly zoom out that I'm guessing is, is a big part of it. What do you think about that starting point, Mac? Yeah, I, I think it's, it was interesting and you kind of brought this up. And there's a good blog, po- blog post out there. Anyone wants to read more about this and kind of the trends and the niches of cre- the creator space and kind of where coaching fits into it. Um, Signal Fire has some good blog posts around it. Um, I think they outlined 50 million creators, as you said. Yep. Um, I also like that there's a term too they mentioned called creators as businesses. And I think it's really yeah. interesting. And there's a there's actually a map here um, that I'll kind of try to articulate in a way without sounding ridiculous because it's <laughs> much more powerful if you're actually looking at it. But 
essentially the idea of creators as businesses is that you've got the different buckets in which creators are kind of monetizing and um, it kind of ranges from subscription. So for instance, if you're using something like a Patreon or a Twitch or a YouTube and you're kind of monetizing your through, through subscriptions, um, tip jar concepts. So buy me a coffee, I think is one con- one type yeah. company um, selling fan engagement um, so cameo, good example. If you, you know, it's more for, for those that really have that kind of influence, but it even includes things like selling online courses, you know, teachable Kajabi, Thinkific, um, yeah. selling newsletters and selling merchandise. So paid newsletters, kind of, that's a good point. Community engagement. And it, it really outlines all the different facets of which creators, coaches, consultants, educators are, are monetizing in the different ways they do it. So I think that'd be a kind of a good resource to post in the show notes, because I think it's, uh, I think everyone's so deep in it and they may be um, so used to kind of business being done in a certain way and where they fit within the market. And, and I think this could be an interesting way for them to kind of zoom out. And hopefully as you're listening to this, maybe even seeing, maybe there's different ways you could be doing it. And maybe if you've yeah. been struggling in certain cases or maybe not kind of hitting the goals or milestones you have, maybe some, some interesting things to kind of take advantage of that maybe others are doing. Yeah, I, I think it's worth probably going through kind of some of those platforms and explaining them a little bit more at some point. We don't have to do it right now while we're kind of big picturing it, but maybe we get into that a little bit later in the show. But um, yeah, I think another interesting kind of perspective that was brought up recently that suggests to me that this is something that's only going to accelerate again um, is that. I've seen some stories on uh, people basically projecting that there's going to be this great kind of exodus from people's typical jobs as they are, you know, directed to go back into the office and decide they don't want to do that, Um, that they've enjoyed kind of this transition to remote work and they just have been kind of on the outs a little bit with their, their uh, employer. And just, this is the time when they're, you know, forced to go back in that they're just like, Nope, I'm good. I'm pursuing this other thing that I've been thinking about forever. Um, There's a lot of people who think that's going to accelerate kind of Uh when this kind of speeds up. And so it could be just a whole other kind of next wave of, you know, new creators, new, new people entering kind of the workforce for themselves uh, starting new businesses. We were talking to one of um, our investors um, recently, and he's into statistics. I'll put it that way. And was was talking about the the even just in like the state where he's in. He's in North Carolina, I think. Was talking about just the the incredible increase in the number of new business filings there were this past year over yes. previous, previous years. I hadn't even thought about that as a signal for kind of this, this trend. And I think, I can't remember what it was, but it was something like double the number of LLC registrations. It was a lot. I was blown away by it because I was, I was trying to sound smart and explaining things to, you know, you know, when you're talking to like (laughs) people who could potentially be, you know, funders, um, you know, you try to sound like, you know, what you're talking about. And then when he said that, I really, I, one, I, I felt like he was schooling me a little bit, but also felt smart for, you know, him kind of seeing the same thing, but he had much better evidence for it than I did. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it makes you want, I'd be curious to see maybe nationally how that's, how that's changed, because I, I think you're right. I think you're going to see this access. I think you're going to see this change. You know, we've all been kind of, you know, working from home doing our thing. And, and I think people have maybe, it doesn't, you know, I think some have argued, Hey, society has a short, you know, has a, has a short memory, you know, we're yeah. going to, go back to the way things were. And I think what we're seeing is some signals saying, well, maybe not exactly, maybe things will look a little bit different. So it, it does, I guess the question comes up, what does that mean from kind of how the creator economy has been defined and how it's evolved? Because one thing too, to just touch on with this evolution that I think they, this, um, this particular blog post I think outlines really well is the, the stages in the process that's been followed. Cause I think a lot of this actually came out of um, they kind of outline pretty well the kind of the different layers of it. And so they talk, they talk about how um, some of it started with even just monetizing your influence and your reach. So maybe mm-hmm. um, some of this started with even, you know, people that had significant clout, significant followings, I think starting maybe, maybe making this progression and starting the movement in some ways. And then ultimately what's happened is 
maybe you don't have to have a million followers to have a membership. Maybe you can have five followers and still create an awesome experience that people find value in. And I I think it really has flipped every, you know, the whole kind of status quo in its head in in terms of how it's going. I also think gaming, I think what's happened with Twitch in gaming has also, has also maybe added some fuel to the fire in some ways, because I think you're seeing a ton of this in the esports world. Yeah, which I think is a, it's a great example because, you know, you think of influencers, you think of like YouTube, Instagram, things that are accessible to everybody, right? Um, Twitch is almost like one of the first kind of niche uh, kind of like uh, kind of influencer marketplaces as a way to look at it. Yeah. Like people kind of grow a following specifically within a niche and that's just being kind of replicated in in every niche down the line. And um. I think one of the things you hear over and over again from people who are, you know, really effective at engaging people online is that it does like, like you said, it doesn't take a million followers. All you need is like a hundred or even a thousand, just like people who are obsessed with what you're talking about. Um, You know, if you're even, if you, if you're trying to, you know, translate what you're, what you're talking about every day into something that you can monetize and turn into a, an interesting business kind of in the modern online world. Um, it doesn't take a ton if it's, if it's like people who are rapidly, you know, following you and interested in everything you put out there. Um, and you can, if you're on like Instagram or Twitter and, and know people who like get a, a bajillion retweets, it's not always people with the most followers. It's people who are just like obsessing over what that person's saying. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's great. Yeah. One of my favorite examples of, of, I guess, of what I've heard in terms of kind of the progression of someone kind of becoming an influencer was really chase from ever forward. Yeah. Um, and I think we've mentioned him before and we've actually done a podcast episode with him. So check that one out. But he started podcasting when he was coaching um, to provide additional value to his clients so that they would get a continuing kind of edge. That was his way to provide scalable content and education to his clients. Yeah. And he started doing it, um, got better and better at it and eventually got to the point other people were listening to it to the point where thousands of people were listening to it. And now he's done, you know, hundreds of episodes. I think he coaches other podcast creators and it, it just shows you kind of where it can take you. Cause now he does all that full time and he's, I, I think he has some partnership deals and things like that. So I, I think the opportunity is right, but it starts with you being an expert in something. And I think we're all experts in something um, and starting to, put out content around that expertise and, and kind of position yourself. So pretty interesting to see, but like I said, that's one of my favorite stories of someone who's just, um, you know, kind of seeing it from scratch, kind of that organic starting point. Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the interesting place to take this and, and, you know, what we've been talking about is people kind of joining the creator economy that goes in like a, a bunch of different directions. Right. And it does end up in, you know, say you're growing an audience and you are just making money initially off like people, viewing a bajillion YouTube videos or whatever. Um, you do start to monetize things that way, but you know, then you see opportunities in front of you like, Oh, I have this audience. I can turn that into maybe the next thing that gets tried is an online course. Right. Mm -hmm. That's very, something we hear commonly is that I, well, you know, wanted to take this, thought I could make more money off of it. I got a lot of people following me. Um, I took what I know. I built it into this great online course. I put it out there. I think we're hearing, you know, like people can certainly make a heck of a living off of online courses. It's sort it's very kind of feast, feast or famine, like the rest of the internet. <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of people become disillusioned over time with that type of business model. And this could be part of what's also driving kind of the growth of coaching over the last, mm-hmm. you know, year or so as people have, you know, tried this model, built out mm-hmm. their online course. Um, and then been disappointed with sort of engagement and, and completion rates and really feeling like they're a part of the impact. So like, I think there's a part of it that just kind of these transactional models are a little less fulfilling. Um, I think online courses are great for 1% of people. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's a I, very concise way to put yeah, it. I, I, it's, well, it's funny. I even think about the online number of online courses I've purchased. And I think it's even probably more so with, you know, I think. I can see why companies like Udemy 
you know, are so successful. I think the idea of kind of, you know, how accessible they make online learning, things like that make a lot yeah. of sense. But I think it's, you know, if, if we could, if everyone's, if, if it was so easy to be an expert or, or so easy, I should say, to be successful with online courses, you know, we'd all just be sitting back, <laughs> sipping yeah. pina colada somewhere. But I think to your point, I, I have always envisioned and kind of seen the learning management um, system or LMS market as being a stepping stone. I think yeah. it was, I think it helped get creators, consultants, coaches, educators. I think it helped structure content. And I think yeah. it helped was a great starting point to say, Hey, look, I've got all this, all this content over here. It's now structured in a really elegant, pretty way. But I think for 99% of people, to your point, I think it's awkward. I think it's inappropriate for their offerings. And I bet anyone, I mean, you're, you're probably listening to this right now and you're probably saying, you're like nodding your head. Cause I know, I mean, we've done some stuff in online courses before too. I think there's, there's some value in it, but I think it's as a standalone for 99% of people, it's, it's not the solution. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. And yeah, we have talked about it before. You mentioned on a, on a show not too long ago that it was one, like we rolled out kind of a, a free introductory course as like a lead capture and it was a really effective lead capture for us. Yeah. Like Do you remember we were, what the completion rate was? I, I mean, I'm assuming it was probably. It was like, not exceptional. I would uh, <laughs> tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> and that, I mean, that wasn't, that wasn't the purpose of, I mean, obviously yeah. we wanted it to help people, but it was one of those things where. Now I should say it might be exceptional. It's hard to get good stats on like what you should be getting in yeah. terms of completion rates for online courses. So I'm going to have to actually, I will, I don't mind telling you guys what that is, by the way. I just don't know it off the top of my head. I'll do that on a, on a future episode. But just to, to level set from what you have said before, we think the benchmark based on things we've read is five to 7% across the industry, right? We don't know, but we yeah, if you, if you Somebody look at it, you'll that. see the sat on, on, um, sort of mass enrollment online courses, open online courses, um, and completion rates for that. The typical stat you see is between three and seven percent mm-hmm. completion rate. I, I think there's an interesting um, example here where coaching is, is such a great complement to this, and and uh, you see it in. It's funny. I think about this is some initiatives we worked in before that were around like diabetes prevention. Yeah. If anyone's familiar, there's a, there's a program called DPP that's out there, diabetes prevention program. And it's essentially, um, you know, I'm not going to get too deep into this, but essentially it's, it, you have a, you have to basically keep a person engaged for, I think it's X number of months and you get, um, I think you get reimbursed for the number of months you keep a person engaged essentially. Yeah. And it has to have, I think 12 months worth of content from my, what I recall. It's very and, defined protocol yeah, for sure. Very, yeah. very defined. And, and I'm probably half right with some of the, some of the background information. So don't kill me if you're, you're deep into this world, but um, we've been approached. I can think about half a dozen groups to, to collaborate with them or work with them on their coaching piece, because I think what we saw time and time again, from different partners, we've talked to about this, they've put the content together for DPP, you know, it's 12 months of content and they, you know, started acquiring users for it. And it's, like I said, I think it's free for the user to basically enroll. Um, and they sign up and miraculously, they are su- sometimes surprised that people fall off very quickly. <laughs> and I think and I think that's where we've seen, uh, okay, we need to have some kind of accountability piece, some kind of hu- you know human interaction to accompany it. And I think if you look at the evolution of how people doing DPP, kind of where they've taken it, I think it shows you where online coaching is really going. It's yes, structured automated content delivery is a piece of it, but it's not the entire thing. Like that, that's a core component of online coaching, but you have to have some kind of human accountability because ultimately for I think 99% of people do it yourself is just not going to work very well. Yeah. Well, that's, it's, it's not a reason to stick around, right? Unless you are incredibly self-motivated there's not enough reason to stick around day to day. Um, when you have a relationship with someone on the other side, who's like, you know, there to help you and working with you, you're much more likely to, even on the hard day, be like, ah, man, well, I don't want to stand up Steve or whatever, you know, like you're going to show up for that, for that person, just that one extra day. And then it gets back into kind of intrinsic motivation mode, but that accountability is a game changer. And that gets to kind of, 
I think some of the other driving forces here, like, yeah, you can go and create online courses and make money off of it. Even people who are successful at that jump to coaching, because I think there's, it's like not just the clients, right. In in the year of the 20 of, <laughs> of the client experience, 2021. Um, yeah. We want to create a great client experience. It's more fulfilling for the client to have the coach, like the connection with the coach rather than going through something on their own, but it's also more fulfilling for the creator coach, you know, Mm-hmm. To have those relationships and get to see people reach those results. Like I've had a, a couple of conversations recently where it's more like that. Like, Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm doing fine selling online courses or whatever. I'm doing fine, you know, with these other, other areas where I'm selling like products and stuff. But um, these, these connections, these relationships I'm making through my coaching are just so much more meaningful uh, to me. And we, I mean, it manifests in different ways. Even coaches who offer like really scalable programs. Um, we just had a conversation with one who's launching a white label with a, a white label version of the app with us uh, soon, who was just talking about, you know, she's a neuropsychologist talking about the things she does. And then she's, she kind of sprinkled into snuck into the conversation. What I really want to do with this though, is help women advocate for themselves in the workforce with this, like, my personal coaching. I hope I'm not giving too much away there. I mean, there are, I'm sure plenty of people who do that, but um, I just thought it spoke to this kind of like inherent, like people find these niches that they're really excited about and want to build connections with people and actually really like be a part of the journey to help them on those journeys. I think that that's just a lot more fulfilling for people than the transactional kind of relationships that you get when you're selling slinging products selling automated yeah. programs or courses stuff like that yeah it's funny because if you think about coach yeah i think about coaches as we you know know a lot of coaches at this point but you think about those people and you know who they are what they like to do it, it is funny because the idea of that transactional approach to coaching kind of flies in the face of all i think a lot of what they try to do you're you're right it's it is kind of funny that's kind of a square peg and a round hole in a lot of different ways there. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see, cause I think half of coaching is the, you know, or 80% of coaching is the connection. Yeah. So without it, it's yeah. Kind of an interesting argument, but um, yeah, I, I think it, in general, like I said, I, I see it stepping stone in a, an, an important piece of the online coaching story kind of in the evolution of it. Um, but it's something where, you know, as all these pieces are coming together, I think there's, there's more that's kind of warranted. Um, you know, I think that what's interesting too, is we've talked about some of these other ways in which coaches are creating connection. Um, audio, you know, we talked about how it seems like the role of audio and what's so funny to me about that too, real quick, podcasting has been around forever and podcasting kind of failed at first. I don't know if y'all <laughs> people really know that podcasting was something that's been around for a long time, really didn't take off until Apple, you know, I feel like Apple put into an, into yeah. the iPhone and then all of a sudden yeah. people are like, Oh my God, podcasting is the greatest thing ever. Um, and so now it's funny cause we've seen that shift too. And it kind of goes to the whole idea that I think what online coaching is, has, has definitely evolved in automated contents an important piece, you know, things like, you know, it, it's all around connection, the different ways to build that connection. So you know, to your, to your point of courses, I think the tricky part there is when you create something that's, you know, I'll call it stagnant content in a way, it's not going to be perfect fit for every single person that watches it. It's going to be some level of awkwardness, like, or inappropriate or not a perfect fit. And if you're someone who's trying to just sell, so you have multiple online courses, your, I think the risk you sometimes see is that, okay, well, if it's not a perfect fit, you know, you're not there to help kind of contextualize for the individual going through it. And then at the end of course one, you know, the hope is that you're going to sell them into courses two, three, or four. Well, you maybe haven't strength, you know, the, you haven't built that strong connection yet to get them to the point, you know, where they're going to convert to that, you know, purchase that next course. So it, it, I think that's a really, really difficult model. Those people, I'm, I mean, I'm blown away when people that can do it that have kind of multiple courses and that's how, the, you know, how they make all their money. Um, I tend to find that, like I said, 99% of people, I just don't think that's the right fit. Yeah. And I think it is like, it is really remarkable. I think, you know, it's when people can do that, it, it must either they're really targeted on what they're hitting and they know exactly what, you know, this segment of people that follow them need. 
mm-hmm. and they're just able to hit those threads perfectly, or it's a little bit of cult of personality going on where they're just so damn engaging for this type of person who's following them that they're able to deliver this. But um, I think, you know, we being given the nature of what we do, we think about like, I don't know, following, we follow investors and stuff like that to kind of keep track of what people are saying. And I always go back to this quote when I think about this type of thing and, and kind of mm-hmm. need to create these kind of relationships in business is just, um, it was a Scooter Braun quote. And he said, whether a consumer product, a tech product or a nightclub, I look for retention before growth. And that's the idea of there actually being a connection there. Even if it's like a, you know, and he gave the example of a nightclub looking for yeah. retention before growth if he's investing in something. Cause he's like, I want to know people are coming back. I want to know they have, yeah. you know, a real relationship there. It's, it's such an important piece. I, I really do. And I think it's, you, you just leave so much to chance. And I think there's a lot of risk if you were expecting systems to do it all um, yeah. for sure. Cause I, I, I think about time and time again, you think about the reasons people churn usually it comes like I, I think you see list after list it's like crappy customer service is usually i think the number one like no matter what you look at it yeah. um and i think it's i think in most cases people will stick around even if they're having difficulties with product you know if something's not working or it just doesn't quite fit their needs yet they'll kind of work around it as long as they feel like they're having a great experience with the people involved Yep. And I think that's, it's something that time and time again, I feel like I I get reminded of that. Yep. And see themselves, like see where the, everything is going is aligned with where they want to go. You know, they feel like they're being taken to where they want to go and Mm -hmm. having a good experience with the people. Those feel like the two biggest boxes that um, need to be checked. Yeah. So I think it comes back to, it's difficult to do all that just with transactional content and that, you know, not to say you can't, but I think it's, that'd be, that'd be difficult. So asking a lot of the content, I can yeah. tell you, I agonize over our content and I don't count on it to create relationships for us. <laughs> so I can only imagine yeah. how much I would agonize over it if uh, I was relying on it entirely. It greases the gears though. I mean, I, I still yeah. think one of my favorite things is hopping on a call sometimes with you know, prospects, partners, whoever it is. And you know, them saying, Hey, I've been listening, you know, like, Hey, I've, like I've been you know, once or twice. I've heard like, Hey, I feel like I know you because I've listened to, listen to the podcast. So it, it like, it definitely helps expedite the relationship. So I think there's absolute value. There's trust building that happens at scale, but um, no, it can't do all of the, the relationship nurturing for you. I like that you said once or twice, we see, we have really close relationships with the three to four listeners that we <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, well, once or twice that it was like, hey, they literally said, I feel like I know you because I've, you know. Yeah, that that I, verbiage. Yeah. It happens. <laughs> it happens much more regularly that I talk to somebody like, oh, listen to a podcast. We're getting emails like, you know, but it's that those words, I think, are just really powerful. And really, in a, and I know we have some of our partners that we work with, I can think of, they have told me that still their podcast is one of their best funnels. Um, yep. you know, attracts the best customer, best prospects for them because those people coming in feel like they're really aligned, you know, with, with their pro, you know, with, you know, with the person they're buying services from. And I think sometimes you can do it through social media. I think through written word, it's a little bit more difficult to build that type of connection. Um, so I think that's where doing something that's audio based or video based can sometimes, I think, you know, be that extension. But uh, no, it's interesting. I think transactional content has a part to play, but it's it's having something like, you know, I think something that's a little bit more fluid, a little bit more evolving. Um, I don't know. Yep. It's my two cents. World I live yep. in. It's, uh, well, I mean, so marketers like to make it a flywheel. If you think about everything as a funnel, um, you know, these are all just layers of the funnel, right? Um, so for our, our cases, I would look at the written word as like the top, 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 like discovery, right? The written word is because of the way the internet works is great for discovering people. You know, if they've written something that you're searching for, you find it, you at least find them there, find out that they're an expert in some way, shape or form and say, oh shit, they have a podcast too. I'm going to check that out. (laughs) And now I'm making a relationship right there. I've just started the process, but 
I think the takeaway here though, is that people kind of, as, as these creators, if we want to focus on them or even coaches that are kind of growing their uh, business, you know, as they're going through this kind of evolution of saying, you know, okay, I'm putting out content on what I'm interested in. Okay. People are following, um, I'm putting out written content. Okay. Now I'm going to start, I'm going to create my YouTube channel. Okay. People are following that. Um, I'm going to create my online course with some of this video content I have. Okay. People are signing up for that, but I really want to connect with these people and turn this into a recurring revenue business and see what I can do with it. Now I'm starting my coaching business and, and putting my program together and, and putting the, uh, your foot down on the pedal and seeing what can happen, obviously using the nudge platform. You touched on this too before we started recording was uh, the recurring revenue piece because I think that is also part of it. I think it's if you're a really really good marketer, like really good, and you, you know what you're doing on the on the digital stuff um, or digital side. It's definitely hypothetical then because that's not either of us. <laughs> well, I know I, that's what I'm saying. I, I I think there's there's digital marketing ninjas that are good at this kind of stuff where they can literally go into Google AdWords or Facebook and they say, Hey, look, I've got a course I'm selling for 200 bucks, I'm going to pump, you know, several thousand dollars into digital ad spend each month. Cause I know for a fact, I'm good enough as a digital marketer through one-time purchases, I'm going to sell, you know, 30 or 40 course subscription, you know, course purchases. So like the numbers play out for, for 99% of people were not that. Yeah. And I think that's where part of coaching is that idea of lifetime value and hey i know if i get a person into my offering and my service i can keep them around and i think that's that idea of recurring revenue is so important because to your point most you know most people can't do that but hey through i'm good at what i do i know i can keep these people around and provide great servicing so it's it's uh i think that's an important piece of it as well is that idea yeah. of avoiding one time purchase speaking to bedrock kind of business stats if you're familiar with the stat that it costs there's a lot of studies on this, but I'm going to mm-hmm. quote what the Harvard Business Review says in, a, in an article. Said, Sounds appropriate. Depending on which study you want to trust, it costs anywhere between 25 times and five times, five times to 25 times more to convert a new customer than it does to keep an existing one. Mm-hmm. And that's the power of recurring revenue and, and creating lifetime value in your customer. It gets so, back to that quote too. You talked about the importance of retention. I mean, it, it, there it is. really in every way. I mean, if you keep people around, then you're going to get them to upgrade or expand. I mean, it's time and time again. That's it. That's how you build a business folks. I, by the way, I think that stat's kind of funny because I see that stat all the time and you're right. It's like five to 25, which is a huge range. Yeah, I know. I That's why someone... they have to open with depending on which study you want to believe. That is a huge range, but even the low end of that is a yeah. nuts number. <laughs> Still a great number, but I, I would love to see those two studies that contrasting ranges to see why it's so much difference between two yeah whatever i'm sure it's an an incredibly hard thing to study (laughs) Mm -hmm. but five to 25 times there you go you heard it here first um that's right so i think i think this will hopefully people found this helpful i think if you're if you're listening like i said we'll we'll include a link in the show notes i say that phil are we including a link in the show notes we are (laughs) now that you said it i have no choice I, I really think that Signal Fire blog post is is a really helpful map to in to at least show you maybe where you fall and to also give you, you know, I think kind of a map for you and give you a sense of the opportunities in front of you as you grow, different things to take advantage of, whether it's tip jars, subscriptions, memberships, um, you know, the patronage sites, whatever you're thinking there's an opportunity. And I think, you know, keep doing what you're doing, but you know, as you evolve your business, there's more and more opportunities you can kind of leverage in different channels. So there you go. Couldn't have left it better if I had an hour to prepare for it. Um, well, that's why they call him Mac underscore gamble. folks. That made no sense. <laughs> Maybe underscore the statement. I, I don't know. The, underscore right. the there's... statement. Everything he says should be underscored. Yeah, We're going we'll to come up with something for everybody. Stay tuned for the, for the clever thing we come up with for the underscore. I love it when people have nicknames that you ask yeah. like, Oh, how'd you get that nickname? And yeah. there's a, <laughs> usually like not a very good story to it of like, why did this even stick? Like, um, so this, this is definitely one of those. It, definitely one of those. So, all right. Well, as we dismount here, if you aren't already, 
please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, your favorite podcast app. You can check us out on YouTube as well. Um, and also, if you are kind of checking out the platform, interested in putting together your own coaching app, um, kind of setting up your own program, if you check us out at nudgecoach.com, one of the things that we're doing is every Thursday, we're going live for about half an hour to very openly walk through the platform. And when I say very openly, like we're, we're going into targeted areas typically, but we will even go as far as showing you specific like potential pitfalls of using the platform. We did that this week. We were hyper transparent on this stuff because we're a growth company that's building, building, building right now. Um, and we can't do anything without your feedback. So keep following us. If you're interested in the platform every Thursday at noon Eastern time, you can check that out. Um, and we've always got a lot of other stuff going on too. So just uh, stay tuned for more and we'll see you again next time.